this lecture, we continue the discussion on additive noise attenuation methods. Now, the previous lecture discussed the pre-stack methods of velocity filtering uh, for the attenuation of noise. In this lecture, we'll look mainly at the post-stack methods of velocity filtering for noise attenuation. But before we get on to that, we'll look at two other methods uh, that are invariably part of the wavelet processing sequence. These are editing methods and the stack itself. And both of these methods uh, attenuate noise, both coherent noise and non-coherent noise. So we'll begin, first of all, by looking at editing. The most important um, form of editing from the point of view of the wavelet processing sequence is the trace killing or muting. This is either of whole traces or parts of traces. Now the most important mute probably in the uh, wavelet processing sequence is the pre-deconvolution ramp or mute. This is a mute which des is designed to remove the first arrival noise before designature or deconvolution processing is done. Um, the first arrival noise affects the design of designature in particular, since designature is designed on the whole record. Uh, the high amplitude first arrival noise must be removed or suppressed by the pre-deconvolution ramp before the designature design. In the case of deconvolution, it's not so critical because the deconvolution design gates can omit the first arrival noise. However, the deconvolution filters are applied over that noise later on, so it's still, in general, it is best to apply some pre-deconvolution ramp. Um, Velocity filtering, the pre-stack velocity filtering, will attenuate the first arrival noise to some extent. But if that first arrival noise contains a lot of high frequency energy, as it would in, on marine data, then some of that high frequency noise can alias through the velocity filtering and still be present on the data when it goes into the designature or deconvolution design. So this emphasizes that it is important to apply pre-deconvolution ramp, particularly before designature. Now other places in the processing sequence where muting or ramping might be done are just before the common depth point stack. Uh, First arrival muting would normally be done again here to remove any noise that may have been missed by the initial pre-deconvolution ramp, and also to remove any of the longer offset traces, uh, shallow parts of them, which may have become distorted due to any more stretching. Um, General trace editing might be done at some points in the sequence to kill bad traces, uh, strong air blast, and uh, other forms of noise burst. Both vertical and common depth point stacks attenuate coherent and non-coherent noise. Now, in the wavelet processing sequence, velocity filtering is the main method of coherent noise attenuation. The stack does, of course, give some coherent noise attenuation, but in general, if the noise is very strong, it will have to be attenuated by velocity filtering. Now, the common depth point stack in the wavelet processing sequence, again, is the main method of non-coherent noise attenuation. The velocity filtering does give some attenuation of non-coherent noise, and its contribution is, is still quite significant. Uh, there are some basic differences between the non-coherent noise attenuation given by the stack and by velocity filtering. Um, 
and we'll look at those on the next slide. If we look at them from the point of view of the frequency wave number, or FK domain, then I think these differences show up most clearly. We're assuming that this is 48-fold stack data from a 48-trace spread. Now, this means that both the shot record to which the velocity filter is applied and the common depth point gather record, which goes into the stack, are 48 trace records with the same offset increment between the traces. And in this case, it's been assumed to be 50 meters. Now, if we transformed a shot record into frequency wave number domain and applied velocity filtering to it, then the cuts in the velocity filter, the Velfield, would typically look something like this. In other words, these areas on the FK plane are zeroed in velocity filtering. The signal energy lies in the top part of the FK plane and is passed by the velocity filtering process. So that remembering that random noise or non-coherent noise is spread fairly evenly over the whole FK domain, the velocity filter is going to remove random noise from these areas. And as shown on the slide, those amount to 17% of the total FK domain. Now, a common depth point stack, 48-fold stack in this case, is somewhat similar to a 48-element array, evenly weighted, uh, evenly spaced array. And if we look at that stack response in terms of wave number, k, it looks something like this. A fairly narrow central lobe on the response and then a series of side lobes, which are not all drawn in here. I've just drawn the envelope for them. Now, if we pick the 6 dB down points, say, on this stack response, they occur at these wave numbers, 0 0.00025, which fall here and here, the positive and negative values on the FK plane. So in effect, the common depth point stack is attenuating this area and this area on the FK plane, leaving only a narrow central strip. Now, of course, the primary energy has been move out corrected before the stack is done and all the primary reflection should have zero dip across the common depth point gather record so all the primary energy of course does lie almost on the vertical axis here and it is passed by the stack. Now in this case that particular area between the 6 dB down points amounts to 2.5% of the total FK plane. So in other words, the non-coherent noise spread over the whole FK plane. Uh, some 97.5% of that is attenuated by the stacking process. And one other difference between the velocity filter and the stack attenuation of random noise is that the stack doesn't give complete attenuation of the random noise because of the side lobes. It's only a partial attenuation. Uh, whereas the velocity filter reject zones, of course, are zones of total reject. However, as we can see um, from this comparison in the FK domain, the stacking process does generally give more attenuation of random noise, it attenuates a greater area of the FK plane than does a typical velocity filter. Well, turning now to the main part of this lecture, the post-stack um, velocity filtering methods, the current process for accomplishing this is called dip filt. And that is a post-stack velocity filter, and it is a process which is performed in basically three steps. Firstly, the stacked section is transformed 
into the FK domain. A velocity filter is applied in the FK domain. And the resulting data is inverse transformed back to the stack section. Now the type of velocity filtering that can be done in the dip filter process is fairly flexible uh, with respect to the zones of the FK plane that can be attenuated in comparison, say, to the pre pre-stack uh, Valfilt program. Another difference to the pre-stack velocity filtering is that the dip filt process allows limited attenuation in the FK reject zones, whereas Valfilt, if you remember, gave total attenuation in those reject zones. Now, the next few slides are looking at um, the type of velocity filtering that can be done in the dip filt process and how this might be applied to a typical section. So we're assuming that this represents a typical stacked section which might be input to dip filt. The key points about it are that it shows a range of signal dips from some maximum positive dip to some maximum negative dip. These are also indicated on the little dip diagram on the right, showing the range of signal dips. And there are various coherent noise modes on the section, and we've indicated the dips of three of them, called N1, N2, and N3. Now, these might occur anywhere on the section. They're just shown separate here, just uh, to make it clearer. Now, notice that the N1 and N2 coherent noise modes fall outside the range of signal dips, whereas the N3 noise mode has a dip which puts it inside the range of signal dips. Now, remember these three noise modes and the range of si signal dips will return to those again in a few more slides. However, first we'll just look at the different forms of velocity filter reject zones that can be, um, oh, sorry, uh, first of all, we'll look at how that stack section appears uh, in the FK domain. Um, the primary signal, of course, falls in a, a wedge-shaped zone bounded by the positive and negative dips. In general, some of the signal energy will alias back across the FK plane. There's quite a lot of aliased energy here and a little bit of the negative dip alias. The noise modes also alias back across the FK plane, the N1 and N2 noise modes. The N3 noise mode, which falls within the range of signal dips, doesn't alias. It's uh, too flat a dip for that. Now, the noise modes in general become weaker or lower amplitude at the higher frequencies, and that is indicated by them gradually fading out or dying out on this diagram. Looking then at the different forms of velocity filter reject zones that can be um, applied in dip filt, the main reject zones and pass zones are specified by four dip parameters, D1, D2, D3, and D4. And these define basically two pass zones on the FK plane. Uh, the areas outside those pass zones are rejected they're not completely rejected. In other words, the amplitude and phase information in these parts of the FK plane is not completely zeroed. It's just scaled down by some amount. Uh, the two pass zones are not allowed to overlap. So in other words, the dips defined by D1, D2, D3, D4 must go in a progression from the smallest or most negative dip to a larger one. Now this particular uh, form of velocity filtering with two pass zones uh, might apply if the 
signal dips were divided into two distinctly different ranges of dips. However, that's not a very common occurrence. And the most usual form of uh, main pass zone for the dip fill process would be just a single pass zone bounded by dips D1 and D2. So that in effect, in the program, we would define D3 and D4 as being equal to D2. So that really then just defines a single major pass zone. The zones outside that are the partial reject zones, R dash, here and here. Now another velocity filtering option is also uh, depicted on this slide. That is a narrow zone of total reject. Now in some software versions this is called the R-dip zone and I'll refer to it in that way. Uh, this is defined in a slightly different manner than the main pass zone. A certain noise dip, it would normally be, uh, call it R, is specified and a velocity window bounded by dips which are 10% greater and 10% smaller than the dip R uh, form that narrow reject window. All the uh, energy within that narrow window then is totally rejected. Now notice that the R dip zone aliases back into the FK domain, but not right to 0k value. It stops, in fact, a quarter of the way back to the center. Now, this is done so that it won't reject any flat lying data on the zero axis, say back here. Note that it will reject some signal energy, but only a fairly small narrow zone. The main pass zone of the dip filt process defined by the D1 and D2 dips does not alias back. Note that the D1 uh, dip does not alias back at the other side, neither does the D2 dip. Now, more than one um, of these R dip zones can be specified in a single run of the dip fill process, and uh, two or more, uh, I think, can be specified in most software versions. Now, looking at how these various forms of um, velocity filtering in dip fill might be applied to the previous typical seismic section, suppose we just apply a single main pass zone uh, to encompass the range of signal dips seen on the section. The picture in the FK plane then would look like this. We have the wedge of signal energy bounded by the maximum positive dip and the maximum negative dip. And the D1 and D2 cutoff slopes for the dip fill process are just a little bit outside that signal wedge. Now, notice that this attenuates a good deal of the noise energy. The N1 noise mode is killed in here and back across here. Uh, of course, it's not killed where it aliases back into the signal zone. The N2 noise dip, which fell in here, is zeroed there, but not where it aliases back. The N3 noise mode, of course, is not attenuated at all since it falls within the range of signal dips. However, notice also that some of the aliased signal energy has been attenuated in this area here. Now, in order to not attenuate that signal energy, the D1 and D2 dips would have to be specified in this way. Um, they are specified as being just slightly greater dips, positive and negative, than the maximum signal dip seen, regardless of whether that maximum signal dip is positive or negative. So 
define D2 as a dip which is just slightly greater than the positive, which is the maximum signal dip, and D1 is defined as the negative of that dip. Now, this specification of the uh, pass zone leaves all the aliased signal. It's not attenuated. But some of the noise modes now, the, no the entire N2 noise mode, and more of the N1 noise mode are passed by the uh, velocity filtering process. So in any particular situation, a judgment would have to be made as to whether it was worthwhile attenuating this alias signal to get rid of the N2 noise mode, or whether it was more important to keep this signal but let through some of this particular noise mode. Now, one other method of attenuating the noise in this particular example is by using the RDIP zones. And if we specify two of those RDIP zones, they can be positioned right over the N2 noise mode and the N1 noise mode. And those, the, the N2 noise mode can be completely attenuated. The N1 noise mode is attenuated uh, where it aliases back to here and then where it extends further into the zone of signal energy. Of course, it's not attenuated. But in simple situations such as this, where we just have, say, two very strong noise modes, uh, let's say, which need to be attenuated, it may be possible to attenuate them with the RDIP zones rather than by just the main pass and reject zones defined by the D1, D2 parameters. Now, turning to the choice of the uh, cutoff dips for the main pass zone in dip filter, um, of course, these have to generally include the range of signal dips. And the easiest way to measure those maximum and minimum signal dips is from the seismic section. The wedge of signal energy is very seldom clearly defined on an FK transform of the, of the section. So it's, it's by far the easiest to measure the signal dips from the section. Now, if the actual noise dips, the coherent noise dips, need to be measured, say, to specify an R-dip zone, uh, then it may be best to measure those from an FK transform display of the input section. Uh, they can be measured from the section itself, of course, but uh, since the RDIP zones are quite narrow and have to be positioned fairly accurately over the strong noise, it may be safest to display an FK transform of the section and measure the particular noise dips on that FK display. Other points to remember in specifying the cutoff zones are that there is a ramp off zone on the reject side of the main uh, pass zones, so that uh, those should not be set with a particularly strong noise mode close to the cutoff dip. Otherwise, it may fall in the ramp off zone and therefore not be attenuated by very much. Uh, the final point concerns the position of dip filled in the processing sequence. Now, there are no really hard and fast rules uh, of just where in the post-stack sequence dip filt should, should occur. Its uh, position is fairly flexible. The main points to remember are that if it's applied before migration, it may attenuate some of the diffraction energy, some of the tails of the diffraction curves, and this could reduce the sharpening of fault interfaces, for example. So generally, it's best to apply dip filt after migration if it's to be done along with the migration. Uh, another point to remember is that dip filt will give some noise attenuation, both coherent and non-coherent noise attenuation, 
Therefore, it may be a value before any post-stack deconvolution in that it will allow that deconvolution design to get a better look at the signal. Um, if the dip fill process attenuates a lot of noise energy, then it may alter the necessary time variant filter and time variant scaling. Therefore, in general, it's probably best to apply dip filled before these processes. Uh, however, on, in many instances, uh, dip filled can be added as an additional process at the very end of the sequence. That would normally be after the TVF, TVS, uh, without any noticeable harmful effects. 